again on time uh, so that uh, these very distinguished panelists are given sufficient time to speak and hopefully uh, there will be enough time for you to ask questions as we go through uh, this time. As you are aware, the title of this uh, panel is Worship Music from Africa and the African Diaspora. Uh, the description that is in the program that you have, I think, is absolutely appropriate for what we will be doing and we will adhere to it. What a gift to have a single conversation uh, with leading experts on the rich history of Christian worship music in the continent of Africa, as well as from the African diaspora communities in the United States and England. What treasures and insights from this rich history should be more celebrated and cherished? What misunderstandings should be corrected? How can we learn from this rich history without misappropriating it? What signature examples of congregational song should we all learn more about and from? And finally, how can we all continue to learn more and explore more deeply connections, deeply uh, connections between uh, across the continent and across Christian tradition? We are very uh, excited to have with us this evening uh, Dr. Stephanie Body, who is Assistant Professor of Church and Community Ministry with affiliations with the Garland School of Social Work, the Truett uh, Seminary, and the School of Education at Baylor University in, w uh, in Waco, Texas. Let's give her a hand. We have Dr. Brandon Boyd, who uh, has been appointed and will assume the responsibility this fall as Director of Choral Activities and Graduate Conducting Program at the University of Missouri, Columbia, uh, and also the choral editor, uh, uh, choral editor at Gentry Publications. In fact, uh, Dr. Boyd and I will be doing a reading session together on Friday. Please welcome Dr. Brandon Boyd. Dr. Jean Kidula, my colleague up the street, <laughs> professor of music, ethnomusicology at the University of Georgia in Athens. Res and her research areas are on po a religious popular uh, commercial music in Africa, the diaspora, and Sweden. Also curriculum development in music studies. Let's welcome uh, Dr. Kidula. <laughs> And finally, Dr. Pauline Muir, who is with us from England. She is the lecturer in arts management at Goldsmiths College at the University of London. Her research uh, interests are in race, religion, and music, specializing in music in black majority churches. Welcome our sister from the UK, Dr. Muir. things that has always uh, given me quite a bit of pause are people who become great scholars of African music. And the first question I ask is, which of the 53 countries? <laughs> Often Africa is seen as a country as opposed to a continent. So one of the first pieces of, of, of uh, intellectual correction should be the uh, unsupported generalization of African music as Asian music or as uh, 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 Latinx music or as music of, uh, of any particular country, uh, of continent mm -hmm. because there are a lot of cultures in a lot of countries. Um, and so when we talk about African influences, we have to be very specific in where this influence is uh, coming. Um, 
Richard Wright. Well, I should say it before I, I apologize. My name is James Abington. I am associate professor of church music at Candler School of Theology at Emory University. And uh, with permission of my dean, I am visiting associate uh, professor at Yale uh, this semester at the uh, YDS and ISM. You notice I said, with permission of my dean. <laughs> so uh, uh, that's who I am. So that's why I was talking about uh, Gene is right up the street. Gene is right up the street at the University of Georgia, and we meet here more than we ever see each other in, uh, in, in Georgia. I want to say, uh, Richard Wright once said, our churches are where we dip our bodies in cool springs of hope, where we retain our wholeness and humanity despite the blows of death. The black church in the United States, from its earliest existence as gatherings in slave quarters, bush harbors, and later praise houses, were known as invisible institutions. However, when blacks began to establish their own churches, two distinct streams of religious traditions influenced the development of black church music. The first stream represented the, that associated with and acquired from white Protestant denominations, such as Baptist, Methodist, and Presbyterian. The second stream represented that associated with those independently developed by blacks, utilizing the concepts and practices retained from their West African heritage. Dr. Portia Moltzby clarifies these two streams. The two streams are easily distinguishable by worship style, ideology, and music practices. The musical repertoire of black congregations that adhere to white Protestant uh, doctrines and liturgies were derived from official hymnals, which included psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. On the other hand, the repertoire of churches where religious ideology and practices were uniquely black consisted of black folk spirituals and gospels having derived from one, West African musical traditions, two, black secular idioms such as blues, jazz, and ragtime, three, original black compositions, and four, white Protestant psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, such as uh, those by composers Isaac Watts, Charles Wesley, and Fanny J. Crosby. <laughs> with such a rich tradition in the United States with these two streams, uh, there's, that leaves a lot of question about these uh, influences uh, and the worship music style of various churches. So I want to start by asking the question here uh, that is before, uh, of the, in your, in your uh, uh, guide here, what treasures and insight from this rich history should be more celebrated and cherished? And I'll start uh, here with uh, Dr. Body. Thank you for that question. So from my perspective, particularly as one who comes to this music first from my own religious background, but also someone who has been doing oral histories and learning about this music from older African Americans, um, as well as my own research. So the two things that I think should be celebrated and cherished are the full humanity of black people and how that comes across through the music. When we think about the spirituals, we understand that though many of these spirituals, we don't know the names of the people that wrote them, what we gather from listening to this music is the depth of experience that they had and the ways in which they wanted to communicate not only their own emotional expression, their own spiritual expression, but also a message to their people 
whether it's about directions to go someplace or not to go someplace, so that it's really rich in terms of what it's communicating about the particular author and their community. And then secondly, to think about the spiritual and cultural agency that we should be celebrating, <coughs> recognizing that, um, as Dr. Abington said, people are bringing with them a culture. People are bringing with them a spiritual understanding that is very holistic and not um, binary separating the secular and the spiritual, but bringing it all together as a worldview. So those are the two things that I would lift up as things that should be cherished and celebrated. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Boyd. I agree wholeheartedly with the spiritual meaning <coughs> that you just think about the spiritual, you take that out of black music and what do you have? Mm -hmm. And what's so unique about the spiritual, and I hear it, uh, is that it has such a message, right? And that message comes from a story and it all, the humanity aspect that my colleague here just mentioned, which is beautiful. And that's the part that gets you deeper and deeper and more connected to its origin, its function, all the aspects about it that makes it, why, did, why, why do you have goosebumps? Well, you know why you have goosebumps? Because it's real, you know? It's not pseudo in any way. It's a lived experience and it's come through a human body and now expressed through the art of singing but not just singing, storytelling. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it is a story. Uh, I go some places that are not the US sometimes, and, and um, you hear, you, you often want to know, like, what do you think about American music? What do you think is American music? Mm -hmm. It depends on who I'm talking to. <laughs> if I'm talking to core directors, scholars, of course, they're mm -hmm. going to talk to me about gospel music and spirituals, things that are out of their touch, out of their realm, out of their experiences. And then you get some pedestrians who say, oh, Broadway, you know, he's very happy about Broadway. But that's okay. They're, they're all connected back to that story of what makes this music so powerful. What makes that harmonic language so intriguing? Why do we not just go from one to five, but we got to pass through seven to six, the, you know, sharp five, then five, and maybe skip that, you know? What makes us have these sort of um, just kind of glacier kind of just wants to take you through these emotional roller coasters? Wants to elicit that from you. So I'm a core director, and, and what I, one of the things that I'm always doing is making sure that I have music of black composers mm. on my, in the repertoire, of course, right? But the idiomatic and non-idiomatic, we know what that means, right? idiomatic of our experiences, blues, gospel, jazz, all the things Dr. Abington mentioned. But the non-idiomatic might mean that I'm a cellist, a classical cellist. Nothing wrong with that, by no means, right? And I have classical roots, and I did not grow up in a black church, even I might be black. <laughs> did you ever guess that could happen? You know, There are black people who did not go to the black church and have all the formative experiences that we've had. Doesn't make them less of a human but that makes them have a different experience. Mm -hmm. And I think one of my colleagues is gonna talk about sort of what, what that means for all of us to think about when we're, when we're dealing with this music. But for me, I just really wanna take us back to the roots of the music, mm -hmm. and you cannot escape the spiritual, and then you cannot act like the spiritual is the mother, when that's really the great, 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 great grandmother, great, great grandfather, mm -hmm. got it? And the difference between the spiritual and gospel music, are they yet, Similar? The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Are they the same? No. Mm -hmm. Is my mother the same as my aunt? No, she's not. Mm -hmm. They came from somewhere, the same mother, but they're not the same. So you have to know each individually. So mm -hmm. getting down to the story of the music that comes out of this experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Boyd. Dr. Muir. Okay, so um, I'm the one person with slightly different accent, I think. <laughs> <laughs> S sorry, <laughs> my sister. <laughs> um, so my context is slightly different um, in the UK, and I think that what I'd want to emphasize um, for my for, for for everyone here is that there are black people in the <laughs> UK. <laughs> um, there are black churches in the UK. Um, and my research has been in black majority churches, and that's a, that's a kind of a, like a global sociological shorthand, if you like, because not all black churches are the same. 
and they are very diverse. They fall under a number of different denominations, um, different theological perspectives, different affiliations. I think the one thing that holds in common, though, would be if we are talking about the root of the music, a lively, ecstatic, um, celebratory mm -hmm. engagement. Um, and I think that we need to go back to the start and where I'd start for the purposes of this exercise would be the Windrush generation. Mm -hmm. So that's post-war mm -hmm. um, UK when there was mass immigration to the UK from mainly the Caribbean, from Africa as well to some extent, but mainly from the Caribbean, where um, companies, politicians went to the UK, went to the Caribbean rather, and recruited people to come over to help with the post-war efforts. Mm -hmm. So certainly for my parents, my father was from Jamaica, and my mother um, was from Barbados, and she came on a scheme that went to Barbados to recruit nurses to come and she came over, she trained and she wor worked in the National um, Health Service. And um, so there, there were large numbers of people and you may well know the history and you won't be surprised. So people came with their religion, they went along to the mainstream churches and they were rejected from those churches. Um, and so that's where black majority churches started. Mm -hmm. People set up their own religious environments. Um, and so it, it's out of that that um, this music came. And so people bought their choruses with them. They bought their hymns, the redemption hymnal, um, Sankey songs. Those, these were the, the, the musics that people were engaging in. And um, there's not very much literature on this, but there is a little bit of literature. And the emphasis is that people were seeking to worship God in their own idiom. Um, they, were, they were kind of resisted the, um, the cold, what they saw as cold worship practices of the mainstream churches. And so I think the thing to be celebrated from this time, which is different to, to now, um, is that there was very much a participatory um, atmosphere. Um, everyone participated. So unlike, you know, nowadays where you've got your very professional praise and worship leaders, many of whom may be in this room actually, on the stage leading the con on congregation. In those days, and I, I, and I didn't grow up in that tradition. Um, I grew up in a Elim church, which was mixed black and white. Um, but I did, I visited a lot of um, black majority churches, um, but the, the whole congregation becomes the choir and everyone can participate. So I talk about my archetypal sister Parsons who would go up and she's delivering a song to the congregation and the phrase was, always was, don't listen to the voice. It's not about the voice, it's about, you talk about the full humanity. It's bringing the full humanity into that space to praise and worship God with. So I, I think that that's something that's very important from that time, where church um, really was the pr probably like the African-American tradition, the place where people found sanctuary, where they found sucker. It was a haven from the racist ravages of society. And it was a place where, you know, that full emotional expression could be released because society was very, very brutal um, um, back then. So I think that full participation mm -hmm. where every voice was valued, you know, everyone, and it wasn't about the professionalism. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's what I'd bring from that perspective. Thank you so much. I was absolutely <coughs> delighted to be able to meet uh, Dr. Muir in, uh, at Oxford uh, in 2019 at an International Congregational Song uh, mm. Conference. And she, the, the presenters would continue to make these references to the wind, the wind, wind rush, wind, wind rush wind. generation. Did, did you all catch that? Did somebody want to know what she's talking about? I did too, tell me. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> the wind rush generation were those people who came um, from the Caribbean mainly, um, to the UK who were recruited post-war 
to help with the post-war efforts because there weren't enough people working in the factories, there weren't enough people working on the transport, on the, the, in the National um, Health Service. So people were recruited from the Caribbean to help with that post-war effort. Mm -hmm. However, when they came, um, <laughs> they got a different welcome, mm -hmm. you know. Um, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't the same. But that we refer to, so the Windrush was actually a ship, um, the Empire Windrush, that set sail in 1948, and it made several journeys after that. Um, but we refer to people who came during that time period as the Windrush generation. And I'll, if I just add something to that as well, um, we've had something recently called the Windrush scandal. So um, a number of people who came during that time, and in those days, people, youngsters could travel on their parents' passports, so, in, you know, small children didn't have their own passports. Mm -hmm. A number of people came at that time um, and um, a situation occurred where the UK government decided they wanted to get rid of certain people that they viewed as immigrants. And there were a number of people who travelled in that time. They, made, they didn't have their own passports because you don't have to have a passport unless you're going to travel. The Home Office um, destroyed all of the landing cards so these people had no documentation that related them to the UK. And so the government said they had to go back. But back to where? Some of them came when they were one, when they were two. You know, they were small children. And it was a terrible, terrible situation um, where people were sent back to the Caribbean. The government have now recognised that it was a devastation. Um, but during that period where people were told that they no longer had British citizenship, they lost their jobs, they couldn't get access to health care. Many people died because of the stress of it. Um, they couldn't get state benefits either because they were deemed not to be citizens. Um, and I believe now a compensation process is going on, but that compensation process is very, very slow. And it has been a scandal. Yeah. So there's the Windrush generation, but there is now this Windrush scandal where many Caribbean people have been devastated by mm -hmm. the actions of government. So now you know about the Windrush. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm. Uh, Dr. Kidula. <coughs> Uh, first of all, I want to start with an apology. I come from Kenya, and um, as Dr. Abington stated, there are 53 countries in Africa, so I'm sorry I'm the only representative here. <laughs> <laughs> a whole bunch more people, because in any given African country, you also have a whole bunch of different kinds of cultures in there. Mm -hmm. And those are further subdivided by the, the mis modern missionary enterprise that mm -hmm. played up the people even further by the evangelized one group. You, you go there, there are Methodist tribe, and then there's a Pentecostal tribe, then there's a German Lutheran, then the Swedish Lutheran. And so uh, we have been subdivided in amazing ways, but we still praise God because God is all that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, if I if I am to start talking about Africa, I think uh, none of these people would have any more time <laughs> to, to them. Because it's a huge, huge place with an amazing amount of different cultures and an amazing amount of different Christian organizations, uh, recent and far. It's 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 really, really, really broad. So that's why Dr. Abington was saying, which Africa are you talking about? Mm -hmm. uh, one of my colleagues at the University of Georgia, uh, when I first went there, uh, we had a conversation with him. Um, and he said, uh, the African Americans are more African than the Africans. <laughs> um, if you think about that phrase, what is Africa? Those who are moved out have this African thing that they were mushed together to form some kind of African thing. Mm -hmm. Those who stayed, we are so diverse and different mm -hmm. that trying to put us into one box becomes mm -hmm. uh, an interesting thing. And they have tried, Pan-African movements mm -hmm. of all kinds, repatriation movements, they've tried like since the end of the 19th century <coughs> to do that. 
So when you think about that, and then you think about music, and then you think about Christianity, and you think about all the different other African religions that exist, um, it's, it's, it's a tall order to try to, to even begin to talk about what do you treasure and what you celebrate and what do you cherish mm. in that sense. So I'm gonna just try to just generalize a few things mm -hmm. and take them as generalizations because wherever you go to Africa, you might find a completely different mm. experience from what I'm going to explain from my own studies and my own experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, growing up in a village and then finding myself uh, as a choir director in one of the biggest churches in Nairobi at the time that had 10,000 people. Don't mm. ask me what I used to do, but I used to stand on a stool and they all saw me when I conducted. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what happened, but it was really, really, um, um, uh, this is when you start to discover that God is, God is God. He mm. will do what he will do. Mm. Uh, and, and you don't have to be afraid of where you are, he will do what he will do mm. if you let him. So one of the things that I, um, um, I wanted to start by telling you that my mother is 91 and a half years old. Yeah. <laughs> and about um, six, week, six weeks ago, she was trending on TikTok. Congratulations. <laughs> As uh, you do. <laughs> I, did not, I did not want to bring that picture up here because uh, there's all kinds of debates in the US about TikTok. <laughs> so I didn't want to offend anybody. But you can look her up. One of my nieces put her up there after one of our, our Christmas celebrations that we had. She had not seen all her kids um, since um, 2017 together. So she, when we all got home, she started singing. And my niece was very shocked because she didn't realize the history that my mother has with the mission enterprise. One of the songs that my, the song that my mother sang that trended um, in part, she had two clips of my mom trending. It was a song in English. As I said, I grew up in the village. So technically we talked at least three languages. Mm -hmm. We talked the colonial language English, mm -hmm. we talked Kiswahili, and then we talked another language, my father's language, like that. My mother did translation work uh, uh, with the, for children's songs, for youth work, mm -hmm. because the only acceptable songs uh, for Christian worship were songs from uh, the West, mm -hmm. broadly, broadly mm -hmm. conceived, and that includes Brazil, because we had missionaries all the way from Brazil that way. Mm -hmm. So my parents had to make a decision about which songs they can translate into our language that would fit, and which songs they would teach us in English, and which songs they would teach us in Kiswahili. That being said, we sang songs in all these languages and more because of the work that they did. <clears throat> and my point is, one of the things that we celebrated a lot of African spaces where I've been, because I've traveled a little bit in, on the continent, wherever I go, I find that uh, we will sing songs from all over the world. You can go to a congregation, in uh, a Catholic congregation, and they will be singing in Nigeria, and they will be singing a song in Swahili. Mm. They do not speak Swahili, mm. but they understand what the meaning of that song is, and it has become included in their liturgy as part of the worship. Mm. I don't know what those Catholics believe about Pentecostalism. I'm a Pentecostal, and there's the story of speaking in tongues, so we know that people understand <laughs> whatever you speak, uh, you know, uh, there will be somebody there who understands. So I felt absolutely at home when I went to a Catholic church in Nigeria and they were singing a Swahili song that I knew very, very well. And I started singing it and they were all just like excited that, oh, now you can tell us how you move with this song. And I'm just like, okay, Nigerians, here the Kenyan cows. <laughs> Kenyan Pentecostal in a Nigerian Catholic church. Uh, teaching them how to articulate the thing. And they still sing it, and they sing it right, because they learned the performance practice. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of different where I am in Georgia right now. Uh, when, if I start a song in an African language, and it's a congregation that doesn't understand the language, they will feel like this is a special song and then they will sing it that one time and then they will abandon it. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I've found in the African churches is they will take those songs and they will 
embrace them mm -hmm. because they understand that God speaks so many languages. Mm -hmm. He will not be confused <laughs> that you are singing in another language that is not your mother tongue. He will not be confused. So that's one of the things that I really, I really actually miss about being in the US that I, I get to just sing songs in English in one or two styles and believe you me, you can sing in 15 million styles because when they were singing that song in that Nigerian uh, Catholic service, it was during ma uh, communion. So there were lots of people going up and down and we sang a song in Swahili, we sang a song in uh, a Ghanaian language, completely uh, shaped. And then we sang a song in Arabic and then they sang in a whole bunch of Nigerian languages. You know, it was like the celebration of the church. Mm. It's like, yeah, God is not confused by your language <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. Mm. And he understands it even when you speak with a funny accent, just the way you understand me with my accent. Mm -hmm. He's not confused by our accents either. So sometimes people are afraid to sing it and say, oh, I don't pronounce it right. Okay, uh, mm. learn how to pronounce it right. No problem about that. Yeah. But God is not, God is not going to be confused because, because of that. And that's one of the things that I, I, I think we need to celebrate about staff. And I also want to pay homage to um, one of the people who actually helped me a whole lot when I first came to the US for my PhD studies. I lived in California and I went to a church called Church on the Way. And the pastor at that time was called Jack Hayford. He just passed a few weeks ago. Um, the funeral, I think, service is this Saturday. Uh, and um, uh, uh, when I went to that church, uh, if you ever lived in California, there are a lot of professional musicians there. So when you walk into that church, I mean, I was managing a huge church in Nairobi. I walked in there and I was like, oh my God, you know nothing. So uh, <laughs> I, 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 was, um, I was involved with uh, the, the gospel choir and I was involved with uh, some of the children things, and I was involved with other things, but it was nothing to the scale of what I was doing in Nairobi, because in Nairobi, I was doing too much. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason why I was very happy to be in the congregation was because I was exhausted. Mm -hmm. I was completely exhausted because I was working full-time at different jobs, and then I was working full-time in the church, mm -hmm. um, you know, doing, doing the stuff that you all probably do in your churches, mm -hmm. but without pay, or in the church side, because I was being paid elsewhere. Uh, like that. So I worked seven days a week. I was completely exhausted. So it was just great to sit down and, and get somebody else to just minister because I was too tired to even think. But that was a time of refreshment for me in ways that I had not imagined. But it's the way that he also talked about the body of Christ. Uh, that um, just thinking about those verses that talk about, there are several verses in the New Testament that Paul talks about the body, uh, uh, one body, many members. You cannot tell the hand because you are, you, are, you are a hand and not a foot, you are useless, you know, like that. We need every part. Mm -hmm. But he also talked about uh, churches. Uh, so he was referencing the different kinds of denominations that exist in the different, mm -hmm. in, in, in California at that time and how people fight uh, especially worship wars, people fight, this is the right way to do this, this is the right, oh. when we get to heaven, we will, all, we will all be upset because we ignored all manner of things that we shouldn't. Um, so, um, what, he, uh, what he was saying was, there are parts of the body, like we have this uh, uh, black American US, and then you have black Caribbean or black British, and you have African original motherland, yay. You have all that. And it's like different parts of the body, you know. And we all need one another for the church to be as rich as it's supposed to be. But he also equated it to the idea of a family. That, you know, we can all live in the same village, but there are different families. And I got to visit Dr. Abington's family, and the way that they make potatoes is very different from the way I make potatoes. <laughs> and, and you can go there and decide, oh, I don't like those potatoes because they aren't made the way that I'm used to eating them. And you're hungry, you'll die. Better eat, those potatoes. <laughs> Better eat the potatoes. Don't, don't sit there and say, okay, my mom didn't make them that way. And sometimes I think uh, my experience of the American church uh, where I've been has been, uh, in, in Church of the Way it was kind of interesting. 
in, you know, they had their repertoire and they had their compositions and stuff. But some places where I've lived in, in, the, in the US, People don't like to do something, a different style in their church than they saw in another church, like that. And then they wonder why they're not growing as Christians or as musicians. <laughs> you know, because when, you, when, when I go to Dr. Huffington's house and I see how they make the potato and I taste it, and it tastes good, I'll go and try it at home because he, maybe they added something that we never had and we didn't know it was nutritious. So sometimes we die because we, we, we refuse to eat of somebody else's food, and the food is familiar. <laughs> it's not like it's weird. It's like potatoes. We eat potatoes. And people just like do things like that. And that's one of the things that I think I celebrate about the African church a lot, that we, we sing hymns. We sing old hymns. Uh, I learned the Kyrie. I'm a Pentecostal. We don't do Kyrie. But I, like, Kyrie Eleison. And we learned all that that 12th century stuff and the sanctions and all that that we will bring up as is convenient in in the moment but we also learned and crouch and then we also had spirit songs which is like a, a, just a different kind of thinking than spirituals but songs that arose out of the spirits of the people and they started composing that people don't even know exist and sometimes they critique I told you that I don't need to talk. Let me ask another question. Come back to you. See, oh. I told so you. Much, when uh, you start, you wouldn't be able to go. Uh, <laughs> but let me start that. Let me start that generously. I'm going to come back down that way. But just tell me, um, uh, if you will allow me to be informal. I mean, I checked, and uh, I just—they just did not put doctor on my birth certificate. <laughs> you know, and, uh, so I'm, I'm still just, well, I don't want to tell you my first I'm name, sorry. but I'll go by Jimmy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, Pauline, we know she had a doctor, Ern. Uh, but uh, uh, Pauline, uh, tell us what uh, misunderstanding about music in the UK should be corrected. What is it that people get wrong? I think that um, the misunderstanding is that everything that happens that we call gospel in the UK is African-American gospel. The, the black British have their own tradition as well. It is related to, but it is different from the um, African-American -Ameri tradition. And I will say that, um, an example of that is when the Kingdom Choir mm -hmm. sang at the Royal Wedding. Mm -hmm. Most people, they sang Stand By Me. Mm -hmm. Most people thought that it was an African-American choir. Um, I heard one pastor, an, a popular American pastor, I won't say who he is in case he's listening. Um, it, I was listening to his live on service and he said, oh, Michael Kerry came and he brought his American choir with him. They weren't. They were a British choir. Mm -hmm. They're a black British choir, mm -hmm. the Kingdom Choir. My stepdaughter sings with them. Mm -hmm. um, they've been singing together for about 20 years now. Mm -hmm. um, there is a black British gospel tradition. Mm -hmm. um, in the 80s, uh, there were numbers of choirs all over the country. Mm -hmm. And there was, a, you know, there was a whole scene and you could go and listen to all of these choirs and there were, um, there were contemporary groups that were coming up. There were jazz funk groups. There was a jazz funk group, um, Christian group called Paradise, who I used to follow. So someone heard of Paradise? Yes, okay, there was Kanos. <laughs> there, there, were, there were all of these groups and there still are. So I think the misunderstanding that needs to be corrected is that, um, that what we do in the UK is simply copying what you guys do here. There is, an, there is an own tradition. And now what's happening is with the migratory patterns, um, many African, West African mainly, Nigerians and Ghanaians are coming in um, and there is a new tradition that's springing up with um, African-American, sorry, um, African uh, gospel. Mm -hmm. 
and, and high life gospel. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's the tradition that's coming in. So there's a, a rich mosaic there of a number of different a African diasporic forces. I was telling Pauline, I learned so much at that conference, mm -hmm. uh, but the young man who's finished his PhD now mm. taught me all about gospel grind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was like, what is gospel grind? <laughs> And it was a, it's a type of... Well, um, grime is, have people heard of grime? The music, not, not the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> grime is a form of um, music. It's an offshoot of hip hop. Um, it's quite industrial sounding. It's really from the streets. It's reflecting the realities and the brutality of um, black British male life, um, mainly a bit like hip hop. And, but there is gospel grime as well. So they're grime artists who've come from the church who are, are doing music in their, in their, in their own language. Yeah. yeah. So I learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, Brandon, mm -hmm. what in, in your, I mean, you, you travel all over. What, uh, what misunderstandings should be corrected about worship music? Uh, particularly, let's just say in the African-American church, African-American, the African. Yep. Well, I think I'm just going to go back to another colleague's point about the difference between the spiritual and gospel music. And that is still yet something that's not clear to people. Um, if it has a drum set, a bass player with it, it's gospel to them. Um, and people don't realize that that's not true. That's not yeah. true. Um, gospel music, we know, those are named composers. Those are people we can go back to. And we can really sort of even, I know I've heard Dr. Abington mention this before, Sometimes we even get that composer wrong because it might be a popular person who made the piece well known. James Cleveland being one of the people who was Thomas the pop Dorsey. Thomas Dorsey. They're, they're the name that you see. They're the that's the album highlight. You know that's the person who's on the top. That might not be the composer. The composer might be a little lady in the back of the church who wrote it and didn't have a great voice, but she gave the melody to there, and then James could play the piano. So now his influence of all that yeah he does have influence and impact mm. but um doesn't mean that that he wrote the song um but gospel music we know that's talking about the life the death and the resurrection of jesus christ mm. now that's that's at least somewhere to start you know mm -hmm. the experiences of people of the enslaved we know those are just those experiences from day to day that they've had um but can you have a gospel song with a spiritual or wandering refrain within that gospel song? The answer is yes, mm -hmm. you can. Because they so closely relate, there are ways to have this kind of collaborative, mm -hmm. this, 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 uh, this meshing of, of styles together. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I try my best uh, to travel and to share with people that it is okay to do this music, absolutely, but to know that it is sacred music. Now, I say sacred, meaning it can be done in a sacred service, in a mm. church service, but it's sacred in the sense of it is something that is more valuable than anything you can pay for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. So now I'm going to my next point. And that, I, as I, Dr. Abington mentioned, I work in a, as an editor of a publishing company, which is Gentry. And, oh, I wish these mics could be turned off. And they can't, and that's okay. But things are sometimes chosen because of how people will feel. And we know that the Jubilee spiritual is the most popular spiritual. So I say every time I feel the spirit, you know that spiritual, you know? You know, Jacob's Ladder, we are climbing Jacob. You know these ones that make you feel a certain way, right? Um, but the sorrow songs are the ones that sometimes I'll never turn back no more. You know? I've been buked and I've been scorned. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Those songs that, I mean, as I say the title, do you know like the top of my head starts to feel? Because me, I felt like a motherless child when my mother said no to a toy and Toys R Us. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the same? Is that the same? And I'm going to change the whole atmosphere. Is that the same? for a child who is taken mm. out of the hands of a yeah. mother mm. the second that child is born yeah. Yeah. to never be connected to that mother ever again. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Maybe killed, mm. you don't want to hear this, yeah. maybe raped for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Maybe taken into a place mm. completely mm. unimaginable. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. 
So if you don't, if you, you've got a problem with talking about all of those things, don't sing the songs. I really believe that. Because if you can't go that far, that deep into it, if you do this little surface level kind of thing, then, then you call me and want me to be like a yamla, come and fix your life or fix your choir. And I'm not. You know what I mean? Because you want the color, but you don't want the condition. And that is, that is the color. I can say raise your salt palate as high as your teeth exist, okay? I mean, I could say lower and sound like Dolly Parton. I can tell you everything that might be, and you know, the, the, the physiology of the mouth and all those things and all the technical terms. Those things not connected to the heart and soul of music or the black experience. Now, am I telling you all to walk around and be depressed all the time because of our experiences? Say no. No. no, but I am saying that you should understand from where this music comes so that as you communicate it as a choir director, as a chorister, now if you are a pastor, I'm begging you to understand even more, to understand what this music does to a worship experience. It talks to a generation of people that know you will never go back and live in 1850. Never. You won't. But that means you don't need to know what experiences have happened because you might have congregants who have, are migrants from other countries, other places mm. that don't have, you know, they don't, they, America is a place they were brought to, dropped, and asked to survive. Mm -hmm. Or London, or mm. I mean, you know, the UK, mm. ask anywhere. Asia, I'm not leaving out anybody. I, I, I might not call you a country, but I'm not leaving you out. Mm -hmm. But just know that, that, that that's sort of the level of care you have to have with preparing this music of the black experience. Mm -hmm. Just because you see us looking good and up there with all our makeup and our bright red lipstick, not me, <laughs> but others, you will still, you still need to know where that comes from. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why do we wear gold chains? Yeah. Why? Because the chains we were first given yeah. Were not ones we bought and wanted to wear. Mm -hmm. They were placed on us. Mm -hmm. And there is a heaviness there with, that, that, that comes about with those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So it's, you look at people and you see them and they look so different than you. It's, it's not about how they look presently. Where did they come from? Mm -hmm. That makes you so much more invested mm -hmm. in that human being. And that human being created all this music that we so love. Mm -hmm. That story, I'm going right back to it. Where, where did this birth, where was this birth from? And why does it have this sort of impact on us that mm -hmm. it does? And that's, to me, that's just always going to be important. Until the day these eyes close, I just hope that that is something I can share with people. That, yes, cherish it, but also understand that the conditions that yeah. were caused to, to birth it into the experiences we see now, even concert stages, mm -hmm. are much more deep than, than just something that makes you... Mm -hmm. And don't ever say fun. It just seems too pedestrian to me. You can't say that, you know, it's not fun. It's an experience, something that you are elevated from earth from, but it's not fun. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, what, uh, what misunderstandings should be corrected? Okay, I don't know how I can follow oh. that, but I'll, <laughs> but I'll try. Um, I would, <laughs> well, I would just add, um, the misunderstanding might be, or the omission, is that we don't consider the ways that the music is a critique of our, of our mm -hmm. cultural mm -hmm. um, understandings and expressions of Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, and I think about spirituals like, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that that spiritual was was likely a critique about the ways that their masters were practicing Christianity. Wow. I want to be more loving in my heart. Mm -hmm. That's humanity. Another spiritual that I think about in the same vein is scandalize my name. Well, I met my sister the other day, gave her my right hand, and just as soon as my back was turned, she scandalized my name. Well, do you call that a sister? No, no. <laughs> do you call that a sister? <laughs> no, no. Scandalize my name. So often, as, as you were saying, that we often think about yep. those more joyful mm -hmm. expressions. We don't think about those songs that are critiques yes. of mm -hmm. our 
practice of Christianity, mm -hmm. and that's really driving us to a deeper understanding of walking like Christ in the world. Jean, let me throw it back down to you now. What, what misunderstandings, uh, what uh, should we have be corrected about this, this whole idea of African music uh, yeah, uh, and worship me, music in, in, uh, from Africa? Yeah, let me, let me maybe address the more musical side of things um, because of experiences I've had where people think if it's an African song, you just need to make the speed a little bit faster. <laughs> <laughs> because all the songs should be that are African should be upbeat. So uh, they, uh, I've, I've, I've been in a, in a situation where I was playing keyboard and the guy was like, okay, we are gonna sing this song, but I want it in reggae. And I'm like, we don't do that song in reggae. In that, in that, in, 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 he said, that's how we're gonna make it African. I'm like, first, reggae is like Jamaican. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Arrest that case. So, um, so just be careful because a lot of people just imagine that all the songs that come from the continent should be fast. Mm. That people don't sing any slow songs mm. or don't have a slow meter. We do. They all don't have drums. Mm. Sometimes it's like, it's an African song, let's put some drum beats in there. No. Sometimes they, we don't sing with the drum. You feel the song. Mm -hmm. If you ever study like Japanese music, mm -hmm. like 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 mm -hmm. Sankyoku, you know that you feel the music with the everybody else. Mm -hmm. So you don't need the beat. You need the bodies around you to breathe it. Mm -hmm. So and 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 you you know when to start it and how to continue it mm -hmm. by feeling everybody else that's around you. Mm -hmm. So you really have to be in that spirit to understand how that is working. Mm -hmm. So from the musical perspective, people just make that, that thing and it's, it's very interesting to watch. Uh, sometimes when you are not on the stage, you're like, okay, wrong thing there. But you, you, mm. it's not your choir, so <laughs> you leave it alone. Mm. Uh, and the other thing that I find interesting is people not understanding the difference between um, musicking with your body and dancing. As soon as you have an African song, people tell you, move, move the body. Mm. Sometimes that's, when you do the body movement, it might be a dance, but it might also be just feeling the beat mm. and making sure that the beat is just right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and the, the, the rhythm is, the rhythm that you do with your body is part of the, the experience of that particular piece. It mm -hmm. makes that piece come alive, that genre. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is a part of the genre. So when mm -hmm. you are doing that genre, you have to do that kind of thing because your body is articulating something else against your voice. Maybe it's even, I, I don't know, you can't call it polyphony because it's not sounding. It's, mm -hmm. it's moving. There's a motion mm -hmm. that is accompanying the sounding mm -hmm. that is accompanying something else. Oh, let's clap our hands now because it's an African song. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. why? Like these others have been saying, think about it. In fact, think about the lyric. Is this a lyric for clapping hands or is it not? And why are you clapping your hands? Just because it's African, you clap your hands. There are reasons why people clap hands, you know. So uh, there are all kinds of these kinds of misunderstandings about if it's, it's African or it's African-American, let us clap, let us move, uh, you know, like that. And, or that every African has rhythm, like, 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 uh, everybody else does it. <laughs> like, you can all walk, right? <laughs> and you walk in rhythm, right? So you don't have rhythm, right? No, I don't. <laughs> you all have rhythm. It's, it's, a, 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 there's a proverb that some people have overused that says, if you can walk, you can dance. What it is saying is you can keep a steady walk. It means you have rhythm in your body of, of some sort. So just from the musical side, just doing your research in order to find out, okay, how does this, what is the feeling of this song? Mm -hmm. And then what do I want to do with it? Because I'm not saying you can't, you have to do it the way we do it. Mm. You may have a different feeling that's coming <clears throat> out for you as you get to understand the piece and you rearrange it uh, in, in a way that, you know, you, you feel 
is working and then you figure out how to work that. Um, the other thing that I really want to mention because of um, just the, the idea of movement and dance, in a lot of uh, analysis that I see or writing about people talking about African music, it's kind of like when you have, when you're in church, they're demonstrative and they start talking about, oh, I went there and everybody goes there and then I went here and everybody goes there and people tell you, I've been asked to like go and teach the children very serious songs because they don't understand the reason why we are doing those movements. Mm -hmm. So they think because you're doing movement like, you know, I might, I might start singing and I say, oh, tebe, 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 and I do, I do, I do, I do. But it's, it's, that movement is, <laughs> if, if, you, if you've been reading Colossians, which I try to read, mm -hmm. I try to figure out how many times that Paul talk about the body. Mm -hmm. And what you do with your body that reinforces what happens in your mind. Wow. Because most people start from, okay, it's the mind that I start with to tell the body what to do. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you start with the body and the body disciplines your mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like that. So some, mm -hmm. some of those songs with those movements, that's what we are doing. We're trying to discipline our minds to this kind of walk. So we will mm. do it, you know, when Anazungu, if I start doing that, I'm like, so the song says that um, the God who is from everlasting to everlasting uh, surrounds me on every side. Mm. And if you think about, just going back to the point that these two have made, if you think about where people have been, yeah. where they've been exposed to all manner of things, yeah. and you feel like you are abandoned, you are a refugee, mm. you are hungry, but you imagine this God mm. who is surrounding you on every side. Wow. But that's the literal translation, mm. that he's surrounding me on every side. Yeah. But the deeper translation is, this is a God who cares so much for every aspect of my life. Mm. Mm. Like that. So people are reinforcing that. Yeah. And so when you go home and you just see people walking around in the village doing this and nobody's singing, <laughs> that they are in their mind, they're like, that song we had in church, yeah. mm -hmm. it's, yeah. you know, and then it actually gets into the secular culture. This is what has happened with some of our pieces. They get into the secular culture because they realize that what we are doing physically is mm. reinforcing something that our minds need to understand. Mm. Wow. One That's of the really powerful. That you said that, Jean, it mm. made me think that the, the beauty, uh, the liberating, mm. Uh, truth of African and music mm -hmm. is that there is no separation between mm -hmm. the sacred and the secular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's something we were yeah. taught. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. uh, there, that separation. Oh, that's church. This is mm -hmm. this yeah. is uh, mm -hmm. this is club yeah. world yeah. or whatever. Yeah. 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 You know. So that that's it. Mm -hmm. Well, I oh my gosh, the clock is just not our friend. But uh, I will take a moderator's privilege and ask, uh, based on these questions, this was a tough one. I'm going to tell you now. I know you didn't see this one coming. But one of the things that was here that I really like, what signature examples of congregational song should we all learn more about and from? Congregational song. Now, we're not talking about spirituals in the sense of being anthemized or concert sung by the choir. I'm talking about the song of the people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The people song. Mm -hmm. So I want you, each one of you, to give me, imagine you are on stage here at the Calvin Worship Symposium and the whole body is gathered and you get to teach one song. Mm -hmm. The one song that you get to <coughs> teach the signature example of congregational song that you want us to know and learn something about. One song. Here's, here's all in the heyday, John, what was it, about 1,500? So we've got about 750. That's pretty good for post-COVID. <laughs> yeah, that's very good. Yeah. But imagine, imagine, what do you say, Gene? You had 10,000? Yes, I had 10,000. 10,000. 10,000 people <laughs> from all over the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you get to teach one song. What would that be, Steph? Well, it would definitely be a Charles Albert Tinley hymn, yeah. and I'm, I'm trying to think of one that it would be. Oh, Lord. Um, um, I guess 
when the storms of life are raging, stand by me. Wow. I would choose that song, and I would also say, um, if people were to have time to read his son's biography of his life, because it's only after reading that biography that you understand all of the storms that he experienced in his life, from losing his child and not being able to bury his child because he had no money, to being at one of his first jobs and not being able to feed his family, having only one stale piece of bread, to having his congregants um, plot against him to even kill him, um, to, to go through his own physical um, disease and, and coming close to taking his own life, when you understand the life that he lived, um, then you understand why he is singing this song and then it has a different meaning to really want God to stand by us when the storms of life are raging. Okay. Brandon? For me, it's give me a clean heart. Yeah. And I tell you, um, <laughs> Because we all think lots of different things. Mm. Mm. And sometimes people don't know what we're thinking. They may not be godly thoughts. They may not be godly actions that no one else knows. When I go to that song, it just it, it gives me an opportunity to be honest. Mm. Lord, give me a clean heart in everything mm. that I do. If I pass by a homeless person and I did not even make eye contact, that's wrong. Mm. I didn't recognize the human that exists here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm trying. Give me a clean heart. You know? It's, it's, a, it's a matter of if, you know, I didn't pay my tithes this month. Mm. I should have done that. Mm. Lord, give me a clean heart. Mm -hmm. Those are not nice shoes, you know? All kinds of things you think. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you have thoughts. You are human beings, right? You know, I was in an Uber one day, and I swear, on my way to church to meet <laughs> Dr. Abington, and this person, I promise you, by the time I got there, I probably should have been high, because the car was just reeking of marijuana. Well, I have never been high on marijuana, but I was close. <laughs> and, and, and really, when I got out of the car, I didn't even speak. I didn't even say, have a good day. He's, and he dropped me off at church. Think about that. He dropped me off at church. I didn't even say bye because I'm like, oh, now I walk into church. Dr. Edmonton thinking I'm high as a kite, you know. <laughs> so, you know but, but I go back to this song and I think, Lord, give me a clean heart for what might seem small but are big. You know, yeah. God lets you decide. Yeah. He lets you decide what's big yeah. and small. Yeah. And after meeting the composer of this, we were, I mean, I'm going back to Dr. Abington because we do work together quite a bit. And to me, that's probably postdoctoral work for me because uh, I went to church one Sunday and he had, um, oh, she, you know, I know Margaret, her. Was Margaret was Durow. Yeah. Uh, she was a guest at church. Sitting there in church, the woman who wrote that song, mm -hmm. and I remember her just sitting on the road, just singing it, and the congregation, they're singing it, they have no clue that she's sitting right there. And she talks a little bit about that, uh, just every day you, you do something wrong, but if that can just be the little tune that just rings in your heart, God appreciates you recognizing that you're human, I'm God, and you are constantly trying to reach this crown that is placed above our heads that you are never tall enough to stand, to touch, actually touch it. But that's not the idea. It's the constant goal of trying. Yeah. So Lord, give me a clean heart. It's ironic that you had mentioned that song uh, was sung, was requested by the new president of Fuller Theological Seminary mm. in Pasadena. There are some, maybe some uh, Fuller folks. <coughs> I have seen a few that were actually there. Of course, John is on the board Fuller Theological Seminary, mm -hmm. and one of the gifts to the president was bringing Margaret DeRoe to that uh, mm -hmm. performance. Mm -hmm. After the reading of Psalm 51 10, mm -hmm. uh, we actually sang her Give Me a Clean Heart. So there's one for Lent, everybody. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, I, I really struggled with this one, and that's one of the reasons is because black British gospel is under-researched. Mm -hmm. um, as far as we know, there's only one PhD 
um, on the history of Black British Gospel, written by my colleague Dulcy, Dulcy Dixon Mackenzie. Um, but I'm going to contradict myself slightly here, and I'm going to point to Donnie McClurklin's Live in London album. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> and on, on that... <laughs> the little girl isn't me, no. Okay. no, no. Um, so he does a Caribbean mel yeah. melody on that me medley. And those songs, I believe, I understand that the history of that was that when he was coming to London, he wanted some um, uh, black church musicians to accompany him. So he went to one of our big churches called Ruach in Brixton. Um, and he said, you know, I want to sing some of the songs of the people. What are some of the songs? So he popularized those black British church songs. Mm. So it's um, Born, 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 Born Again, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let the Fire Fall on Me, Hide Me Under the Rock. Mm. And, you know, if you know the album, he says, you know, I want you to sing it like you're from Jamaica, yeah. like your parents' parents yeah. are so from, from Jamaica, Jamaica. <laughs> like your parents' parents' parents are from Jamaica. So, <laughs> So, yeah, yeah I, I would point to Caribbean medley, cool. yeah, for, for signa great. signature songs, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so if I have an American audience, I would want them to sing Waymaker. Mm. Mm. Um, it's made up of uh, a composition by a Nigerian worship leader. Mm -hmm. um, most people don't know that. No. <laughs> it's the Michael W. Smith version yes, yes. of the Pentecostals of Alexandria version. Yes. I say that because um, when I first suggested the song to um, the worship pastor at the church I currently attend, uh, sung by uh, Snatch herself, yeah. he said, no, uh, people will not understand this song. Uh, mm. So that was in 2017, because uh, the song was trending in Africa in 2015. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah, wow. it was tre trending in wow. Africa in 2015, wow. and it was it was this, a second song. She had sung another song that was trending called I Know Who I Am, mm -hmm. yes. that came out like 2010, 2011, mm -hmm. uh, and was trending. So when people got to know her, when she did um, Waymaker, it was trending in Africa. I mean, I would go home in every church, Catholic, mm. Protestant, uh, every, everywhere. Everybody was singing Waymaker. So I came and I told my pastor, we need to try this song. We are called Church of the Nations. Why don't we sing this? At least it's in English. It's not in Yoruba. And he said, no, people won't understand it. And two years later, after he heard the Pentecostals of Alexandria sing it, he was like, we need to sing this song, G. It's the best song I've heard in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I was like, okay, so we did it. Uh, I, I didn't argue with him about it. Then I reminded him about it two years later. <laughs> I didn't do that that day. That day he, he was just like, we have to sing this song. Have you seen this? And I'm like, okay. So once it has gone through people's, uh, psyches and it has been Americanized, then it makes sense to the people. <laughs> That's normal. I don't, I'm, I'm not arguing about, about or against that, uh, you know. But she, he couldn't, he couldn't feel it from mm. the Nigerian side uh, mm. of, of the way she was doing it. Mm. But one of the things that I like about that song is not the first part of Waymaker, but it's it's the part that says, "You are here, moving in our midst." Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Why I like that is because. Uh, Coming from a Pentecostal tradition, people are always saying, we want to invite the presence of God here. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, this is so Old Testament. I'm so sorry. I'm a lay, I'm a lay person <laughs> here. Uh, and those of you who are theologians, you can get at me afterwards. So people are saying, we want the presence of God here. The way I understand the Old Testament, those people used to walk around with the presence of God in some, some ark, like that. But Jesus came and just, he's here. Yeah. He's, he's, he's in our midst. Yeah. He's, he's like right here. Yeah. And he's not afraid of the darkness. In fact, he goes through the darkness so he can bring the light. Yeah. Up the, he's not afraid of hell. He went out there and he got the key so we could get out of there. Like People <laughs> think that you know he's, he's afraid of the, the pub because that with the marijuana thing that he can't <laughs> He's not there with the marijuana guy. He is right there with the marijuana guy. That's why the guy is still alive. Otherwise, he'll be dead. It's, it's, it's like, when you, think, when you think that God is present everywhere, 
and we don't take advantage of it because we think, mm. okay, now I'm sinning, so God is not here. He's not afraid of sin. That's why he died. Yeah. Mm. So that he could like do that sin thing away. You know, like that. So when, when, when that line that she has in there, you are here moving in our midst. Mm. You are here doing all manner of things. I, 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 I'm like, if you have never sang it, Okay, don't look for the snatch version because you might not understand Nigerian English. <laughs> but there's a version by Michael W. Smith, and there's a version by Pentecostals, and there's a version, but there are like there's 15 so million versions, versions mm. that <laughs> came out during COVID. Mm. So you can yeah. find your favorite musician. They oh, all sang it. <laughs> <laughs> if you read the story of Snatch herself, you might even sing it much more differently. Mm -hmm. mm. If you know the history of Nigeria, yeah. you will also sing it differently. Mm -hmm. But mm. that's why it resonated in Africa. It was like, it didn't matter where I was. I was in Sudan in 2015, they were singing it. Yeah. I was in South Africa, they were singing it. Wow. That, that, it, it became kind of a, a worship anthem, mm. just, just like that. And that was also amazing because, you, you know, it's when CCM, whatever the, people who license those things is after they got it and they transcribed it however they transcribed the thing yes, yes. that people thought now we can sing it because it's transcribed no 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 just listen to the piece <laughs> <laughs> you'll be good well, thank you well i guess the piece that i would choose uh that might uh, surprise you and you said an anthem and it's a piece that has been probably nicknamed the Negro National Anthem, mm -hmm. but was never ever intended to be the Negro National Anthem. Mm -hmm. I would teach Lift Every Voice and Sing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because James Weldon Johnson in the year 1900, mm -hmm. right down in Jacksonville, Jacksonville, Florida, as the principal of the Stanton High School, mm -hmm. was preparing mm -hmm. for an Abraham Lincoln birthday. Mm -hmm. And they were getting ready for this birthday. And, uh, it was after Emancipation Proclamation. Mm -hmm. And he decided, as opposed to giving a speech, he would write a poem and then get his brother, John Rosamond, mm -hmm. to set the poem <coughs> to music. Mm -hmm. And that's what we said. It was probably in the 20s or 30s when he moved to New York and was. Uh, with the NAACP, they started calling the Negro National Anthem. There, there was no vote. <laughs> I've, never heard, I've never heard any of my, my relatives, anybody talking about when we voted on that song. <laughs> and all black folk weren't in the NAACP. So, you know, that was just, they, that was their thing. But this song, if you look at it, and James Weldon Johnson was a very prolific and profound poet. Stanza one mm. is simply an exhortation to just open your mouth and sing mm. of liberty. Mm. There's a whole lot of people who need to be set free and it's not from slavery of chains. There are other kinds of slavery mm. that we are addictions and, and that we things in our life. So we need to be free from a lot of things. So to lift every voice and sing. Those of you who could do it, do it with me real fast. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmony of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening sky. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the hope that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. Wow, anybody can sing that. <laughs> That's a good morning start. <laughs> but then he says the second stanza is the stanza of struggle, of the journey, of the, of the, of the real oppression. And what does he say? Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed. We have come over a way that with tears have been watered, 
We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughter. Out of the gloomy past, till now we stand at last, where the bright gleam of our bright star is cast. What? Native Americans? Jews? Chinese? All African, there are oppressed people anywhere can sing that. But that last stanza is a prayer, and it's really almost, a, it's really a collet in the broadest sense of it. And that's why you hear it often prayed in black churches. And what does it say? God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far on the way, Thou who has by Thy might led us into the light. Here comes the petition. Keep us forever in the path we pray. What's the reason? Lest our feet stray from the places of God where we met Thee. Lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forget thee. Here comes a little benediction. A doxology. Shadow beneath thy hand may we forever stand true to our God, true to our native land. You can fill in your God and you can fill in your native land. Amen. I would liberate you to sing that. Well, the time is 846. I'll say this. I am usually very, very bashful about this, but I'm so grateful for GIA making possible um, a revised and expanded edition that I did called Let the Church Sing On, Reflections on Black Sacred Music mm -hmm. that just came out last uh, uh, It was a book I wrote in 2008. It's a collection of essays about the spiritual pioneering and contemporary gospel writers. You talked about Margaret DeRoe, but I talk about uh, Albert Tin Giles Albert Tinley. I talk about Lucy Campbell, yeah, anybody you don't know, as well as Glenn Burley mm -hmm. uh, and some other people's in there. Then I talk about some pastoral considerations. That's, that's the section that's going to get me in trouble with some folks. Uh, and then worship resources. If you want to know more about these, there are a number of things that, have been, that uh, I've been privileged to work with and there are some of those, and they're all in one collection. And if you go by the GIA website, that's the thing. Anything that I perhaps would have said, I put there. It's very exciting for me. I dedicated that book to the Hartford Memorial Baptist Church in Charles Adams, where I served for 13 years when I was a student here at the University of Michigan, working on my master's and doctorate. And on Sunday, I will return to that church to do a book signing, uh, to dedicate the book, uh, rededicate it uh, to the pastor who is now emeritus and uh, interview with the DSO who's getting ready to honor him. So that book is here, and I would certainly love for you to have it. And I'd be just thrilled to sign it for you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Brandon. Thank you so much, Pauline. Thank you so much, Jean. Um, I have to just ask this, if John will let me. We uh, have a lot of times, but is there a question that is just so burning that if you don't ask it, you'll go home and you'll say, I wish I hadn't even gone. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't get to ask this burning question, and uh, I would just love if you will give me five minutes. My sister. You said early on when you listed off the things you all would talk about, is uh, the thing about cultural appropriation. And, um, and, 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 we, and we love to sing songs in our church of the traditions that you've been talking about tonight, and I want to do that respectfully. So I just want yeah. to give you Oh, we've all talked about that. I think Brandon, I, I, think, I think Jean said it best. You're going to trip over the language. You're going to trip in life over a whole lot of things. You're not going to get everything right. According to the Germans, we will never sing Bach right. <laughs> in fact, there are English choral conductors that don't want to hear any UK music sung by white Americans. They say it is a sound that is just distasteful to the British music. <laughs> there are folks from France who said, please, don't do Poulain. <laughs> oh, Debussy. Just, 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 we, you, your, your French is awful. 
you know, who taught you that language? You know, it wasn't us. So it's, I love what Brandon said. And I, Brandon, thank you for that. I know you want the color and the appropriation, yeah. but can you really take the condition out of which that came? Yeah. But more importantly than that, let God give you credit for trying Amen. to include people, Amen. even if you falter, Amen. even if you fail. Yeah, you can learn some things. There are spirituals. Paul Johnson used to be notorious for putting little keys, pronounce it this way yeah. and that way. And, and uh, I ain't got time today. You got to, and you're so busy trying to get all this stuff to do it. You got everything right. And it is about as meaningful as watching a dog chew a bone. <laughs> <laughs> and probably they're not even recognized by the slaves. And it's not recognized. It's not recognized. These, these are not recognized. If you really think slaves were out in the field singing, sooner we'll be done with the trouble of the world. <laughs> 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 Yeah. And if he had lived, that would have been another version. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> every six months, you know, so before he died, you know, so I mean, that's not the way, the last way it's done. Yeah. Spirituals are fir folk, first religious folk music. Yes. In this book that I was talking about, I talk about some of that. Because I know what people want you to do. Like you said, come and make us sound. How do you all pronounce it? The way we feel? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes because I love Brandon, I, I wouldn't want anybody getting no tapes of the way I talk to Brandon. I call it, hey, and I mean, we got names, and we got stuff. Now, here, this is Dr. Brandon Boy. <laughs> Can't tell you what I call Brandon when we have on the phone. <laughs> and the way people feel, like you said, yes, people. somebody get happy church. Yes, Lord. Yeah. Kyrie <laughs> and Lady Soul. Oh. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Yeah. 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 Is that Jesus? Oh, well, I have never forget James Cleveland. We were together in uh, San Diego and uh, at a NAM convention. Oh. And uh, the uh, James was teaching this traditional 19th century gospel, the lecture. Uh, it was a hymn. Some of you may know it. He giveth more grace. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know that hymn? Mm -hmm. Let me see the hands of people know that hymn. Mm -hmm. Wow! That's unbelievable. Well, this was the hymn that James Cleveland was teaching at now. Well, he was trying to put a little God in the beat. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that he giveth more grace and the grace, the grace grow greater. Grace and, he, and, so, and it says something, and the burdens grow lighter. Mm -hmm. So one lady was sitting there like, this is so beneath. She was black, incidentally. <laughs> but nobody knew her in the royal family. <laughs> nobody. nobody. Not even the milkman. <laughs> she was sitting there. So finally, Reverend Cleveland, he said, yeah. <laughs> Question. You know, my choir did Messiah, and we were singing that chorus, his bur uh, you know, his yoke is easy, easy, and his burden. And some of the editors say that it should be, and the burden, burden, uh, as opposed to burden, it's just, it's, it's just a little, he looked over, uh, 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 who was playing the piano? Uh, Kurt Carr. Kirk was on the piano. Wow. He was so crazy. He said, what's he say? <laughs> <laughs> he said, it's, should that be, and he gives it, and the burden, or should we say burden? Good. <laughs> he said, well, how do you want us to pronounce it? He said, burden. He said, burden. He said, burden. He had a very thick thumb. So he told me, he said, burden. He looked at her like, now, nah, what? She said, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't wait. I said, let's see how you can do that. <laughs> so I, I say that because I want you to be liberated. I appreciate that. But you know the, the statistic that is so horrible is that there are more spirituals being sung in non-black churches. Amen. Than there are in black churches. 
Mm-hmm. Now, it's, it's, it's Black History Month. Now, I told them at our church, I said, you know, now the truth of the matter, we're going to be black in March. I ain't going to try to see you as a spiritual over the next four Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> this is funny every time. I get to be black in August. You know, I'm a, you know, if I get to where I plan to go, I'm gonna be darker. So you know, I mean, why do I need to try to get all this stuff done in February? So what do you want me to do? Teach Irish music next month? You know, everybody's gonna dress up in green. You know, or something. So, uh, you know, I, I do, I tell people, just try being black all year. I mean, just go with the color you see, you know? And, uh, and, and, and we sing, it, 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 it just breaks the heart of people to realize that the woman that wrote Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross. Yeah. Yes. Oh, my grandmother. And, and uh, uh, it is, uh, the pass me, oh, pass me back. And, uh, uh, I am thine, oh Lord. Yes, Lord. Written by Fanny. Sister Fanny. Kid. She was from Mississippi, but you know, she was a black, she was a blind white woman. <laughs> <laughs> but wasn't her name Fanny? That didn't have nothing to do with it. <laughs> And she was not the president of the mission circle of the National Baptist Association. <laughs> Now you go in a black church and not try singing Blessed Assurance and see how long, how long you last. Okay, I guess my point. <laughs>